And since you went under contract, we got a backup offer at 100. So now July the 1st rolls around. Oh, we need a couple more days. My seller says, no, bump, you're gone. And now the guy for 100's on the bubble and we're gonna sell to him. You will see that a lot because it makes this, it's a lot smarter for the seller to give that current buyer three or four more days because he would have to start all over unless he's already got another buyer waiting in the wings. So time is of the essence has nothing to do with forming it. It has everything to do with completing the deal. That's the timeline you have to complete it in. Okay. Race all night. Counter offers, we have talked about those. A counter offer is when the uh, original seller goes back to the buyer and that counter offer can go and keep going and hopefully you get all the way to the acceptance. I have done many times before where you've gone to three or four counters and you've ended up with a rejection. Hey, the buyer just can't see that last $300 and the seller just can't release that last 300 and they end up that saying, sorry, that's my highest offer. Okay, so during that counter offer process, you hope that cooler heads prevail and you eventually get to this. Now, there are things called multiple offers and that's when buyers, you get multiple buyers putting in offers which is going on right now because of the hotness of the market and the seller has multiple offers and he literally can call up and say, hey, look, all you guys, I want this thing that we call highest and best. This allows the buyers to then go, well, we offered 100, but we could see ourselves really giving 108. Okay, well, I'm telling you, I've got multiple offers so give us your best offer because you may not win. We had one, one of our agents, Monday of this week, put an offer in $8,000 over the list price and still did not win. House was listed at 125. They put an offer of 132 and got beat. That's actually 7,000, but you get my point. <laughs> Math major. <laughs> Any questions about offers or counter offers? All right, are we all back? If you can hear me, make sure, just give me a thumbs up. All right, all right, so I want to talk about one other thing real quick. The course on Monday and today's course, you all will have access to it, but I have to work my magic, all right? Because literally what it is right now is a six hour recording from Monday and it will be a six hour recording today. So I will cut it up put it into sections. If you remember all my courses, how they're 15 or minute videos, I'm gonna do the same thing with this. So yes, every one of you that are here that paid for or used your points to be registered in this course will have access to this course at a later date, all right? That later date hopefully will be tonight um, tomorrow is probably not going to happen, uh, to be hundred percent honest with you. I have a tea time at 1130 tomorrow, <laughs> so I will be on the golf course. Um, but you will get access to this. All right. So you will get all of the recordings and you can go back and listen again. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's continue on. Here we go. The leasing and property management section, 5%. Once again, 
three or four questions. So really, uh, in a property management, let's talk about one of the things in a property management, we, or one of the things we mentioned the other day, is remember there's this thing called a universal agent, which we probably know better as a power of attorney. Then we have the general agent, and we have a special agent. Property management works under which one of those? Hold, hold up, everybody hold up your finger. One, universal, two, general, or three, special. Property management is which agency? Which type? I saw two of you answer. Let me go over here. What's everybody writing? Wendy, hold your fingers in front of your window so I can, you're too dark. Two, it is actually, well, we've got an answer for every one of them. The actual answer is it is a general agent. Remember, universal agent can do everything that person can do. They are a power of attorney. They can do everything in every area of a person's life. I try and remember stuff like this, like big ones and subgroups. A universal agent can do everything in one area of a person's life. This would be a property manager. They can enter into agreements, they can collect rent, they can screen tenants. They go to the bank, they pay bills, but only on the one property they are given power to do that on. A special agent can do one thing in one area. That is a realtor. We are hired to list the properties, that's it. All right, so look at this little chart. This is the way I look at it. Everything in every area, everything in one area, one thing, one area. So a property manager is conferred general agency and he is conferred that through the management agreement, which is very analogous to what a realtor would call a listing agreement and it's Realtor, not Realtor, Raymond. So the management agreement is what the grants general agency were a listing agreement, grants special agency. Guarantee that's probably one, gonna be one of your three questions that deal with the type of agent that a property management deals with. So let's talk about the different types of leases. I'm gonna switch over to the whiteboard. This is much better. Now, there are three or four different types of leases. If, so let me ask you a question. If a person pays $500 a month to their landlord and that's all they pay, what type of lease is that? This is, typic this is typically what you see in the residential world. I heard the answer. It is a gross lease. All right. That is a common question. If you're only paying one amount and the landlord then takes all of the bills out of that, like the taxes and the insurance and maybe the HOA, you are paying a gross lease. Now, as the tenant, if you are paying $500 a month to the landlord, but then you're going out here and paying some of the expenses of the landlord's expenses, 
What type of lease is this? Yeah. That's the net. That's the net lease. Make sure you understand the difference between the gross and the net because I can almost guarantee that this is going to be somehow one of the questions. Depending on what you pay, you know, this one is just one amount. This one is one amount and then some expenses tied into it. That would be the net. The big mamaluka of that is what they call the triple net. And this is where the tenant pays all three of the major expenses, taxes, insurance, and maintenance. That would be the triple net lease. So there's a gross lease and a triple net. Typically, this is commercial, this is residential, but don't let the test fool you that potentially I could rent a warehouse and only pay just that amount, it would still be a gross lease, even though it's commercial. So that residential commercial split is not 100% accurate. Look at the question that tells you who's paying mainly these, the expenses. If the expenses are added to the tenant, it's a net lease. If the expenses are paid for by the landlord, it's a gross lease. They have these things called variable lease, I believe. What's the next thing we want to talk there? A variable lease. A variable lease is where the rent starts here, and then at some time frame, it may jump up. You know, starting in July... So up till July, I pay one rate and then I pay another. That is variable. A percentage lease is where the tenant pays a base amount plus or a percentage of sales. <clears throat> List, let me. The key thing to watch for is this right here. <laughs> Do they pay a base plus a percentage? or do they pay a base or a percentage? So let me give you an example or a, a question. If the company pays $5,000 a month base or, uh, that's not right, or 10% of the gross sales, whichever is greater, tell me if they sold 1.1 million, what is their monthly rent? What is their monthly rent? I take the 5,000 a month because 60 versus what 110,000. You did it the quick way. 10% of 100 or 1.1 million is 110,000 a year, right? 500, 5,000 a month times 12 is $60,000. So in this scenario, they would be taking the 10% of gross sales because it said or. Now, we can change this completely, and this is a really bad example, but just so you get what I'm saying, if this said and, 
their rent would be 170,000. If it said or, it'd be 110,000. Everybody see what I'm saying? This, this is important right here, that word. And a percentage or a percentage. So watch for that on the exam. That is a percentage lease. There is a thing called a land lease. A land lease is where the property is or the ground is actually owned by someone else and they lease or sell the building and airspace to someone else and the lease only covers the land. Oh, my little picture really pretty. What would be the advantage of a land lease? Why would this company want to lease the land? Free up the capital. All right, one person again, please. You can't depreciate the land. Exactly, that is a very big key. You cannot depreciate the land. So why pay for it? Because if I lease it, that becomes an expense on my taxes and that I can write off. So one of the major reasons you use a land lease is for this reason right here. The other reason is typically the person knows the value of their land and don't sell it. Like Simon, all of the stuff that sit around all of the malls, Washington Square Mall, Castleton Mall, Greenwood Mall, that's all Simon's land. He doesn't want to sell it, so he'll just lease it to Chili's or the jeweler store or whoever because he's going to collect rent for it but he's also keeping it. At the end of the 99 year lease, what happens to that building? At the end of the land lease? It becomes the landowners. Exactly. It becomes the landowners and then the tenant would just move out and the landowner would now take the building and which they would then probably and build out for the new person who wants to sign another five or 10 year lease. The best example for us old people, if you remember the used to be the ground round right there on County Line Road is now called Jared's. When the ground round went out, Simon destroyed the building and rebuilt Jared's diamond place. Still Simon's land he owned the building when Ground Round left. Now it's Jared's. So key provisions in a lease agreement. Remember, there are four types of leases that we deal with. If you can remember the leases, one is called an estate for years. Now watch this. This is another one of those situations I just showed you in the um, agent types. Watch this. That stands, there is a definite beginning in the estate for years. There is a definite end in the estate for years. When you sign the lease, it will say starting August the 1st of 2020, terminating August the 1st of 2021. You already know the end date when you sign it. It has a defined beginning and a defined end. The second lease is in a state from period to period. It has a defined beginning, but no defined end it will self renew itself when it comes to this. It'll then renew and then renew and then renew. 
and you must give a notice. What kind of notice? Written notice. Written notice by either party to actually end this period to period. And then they have an estate at will has no defined beginning, no defined end. Notice this pattern right here. It's the same pattern that was in the agency. Remember, we had universal agent, general agent, special agent. It had, you know, everything everywhere, everything one, one, one. It's that same pattern they use a lot in real estate. You've got the one that is completely defined, one that is partially defined, and then one that is kind of undefined. And an estate at will means, at will means whenever, hence the word fire at will. So it has no defined beginning. It can start tomorrow. It has no defined end. It'll just go and go and go. And then the tenant comes up and drops you the keys and said, hey, I just moved out. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't or still don't abide by a lease. They still pay. They still have to adhere to all the rules. They just have no defined end on their lease. Okay. Landlords and tenants, landlords and tenants, we work under the Uniform Landlord Act. Uh, what is it called? The Uniform Tenant and Landlord Act, which basically gives tenants all the power. And when a contract or a lease gets breached, there are two types. There is this one called actual eviction and one called constructive eviction. Which one of those deals with the landlord suing the tenant for breach of a contract? Actual. Right. This is the landlord suing the tenant because the tenant breached the lease. They didn't make the payments. They violated the pet policy. They damaged the property. Whatever was in the lease that the tenant breached, the landlord is looking to gain back his property and all of the rights that he gave to the tenant or the lessee in that lease time frame. So the constructive is where the tenant sues the landlord. What is the key issue with a constructive eviction? There is one major key issue. Uninhabitable. It has to be uninhabitable for it to work. You gotta move out. And that's why they move out. All right, has to be uninhabitable. Think about this, basically the tenant evicted themselves. They evicted themselves. And then the landlord's like, hey, you owe me rent. No, I don't. I evicted myself because it's the middle of December and I've given you two months and you've not got the heat fixed. We moved out. All right. That would be constructive eviction. So in this process, <clears throat> the tenant and the landlord, I want to go back to this other section here. Go back here and talk a little bit more about this. Remember, we have those five rights that we deal with. We have possession, exclusion, control, quiet enjoyment, and disposition. We do not give disposition. We do give quiet enjoyment. We do give, we don't give exclusion. We do give possession. And we do give control to some extent. That control is what defined the lease. Think of the lease as the operating agreement or the instruction booklet on what control the landlord gave the tenant. 
You know, it may say you mow the lawn. It may say landlord mows the lawn. So think of the lease as the instruction booklet to the amount of control that is given. We pass quiet enjoyment and possession to our tenant, but we certainly don't pass disposition. We also don't pass exclusion. A lot of land tenants think that's true, but we don't. I still have the right to come on. Typically, I will tell you here in the lease, I'll give you 24 hour notice, except in case of you know, an emergency. Free flowing water, fire, cries for help. I don't need to give you notice for that. All right. When the lessee receives those rights, it's for those time frames we just talked about. At the end of those time frame, all of the rights go back to the lessor, which is the landlord. Therefore, all of these rights are called a future interest. And when the landlord sues the tenant for actual eviction, all he's looking to do is to get the judge to expedite that process, get back the possession, you know, get back the quiet enjoyment because the tenant has failed to adhere to the lease, the lease or the other way around if the tenant sells, sues the landlord. So there are certain rights and obligations that both parties have to have, and they are defined in this group of properties here. Any questions about that so far? What are the fiduciary responsibilities? A property manager has three responsibilities. Can anybody name what they are? Protect the uh, protect the interests of the property. Protect the property. That's one. Earn money and meet the objectives of the landlord. Which one of those three is the most important? Protect the property. Yes. Somebody told me that that was a question once before. The main obligation is to for the property manager to not allow the property to fall into disrepair. There will be times when you have scheduled to not make money. It's called a turnover. Hey, we got to put new carpet in, so it's going to be down a week. But you must always protect the property. Okay? Property managers have ADA issues and fair housing. And maybe the word issues is not the right way I should say that. They have ADA compliance obligations. There are two ADA issues, Title One and three. One of them deals with the public's access and one of them deals with employee access. Which one is which? Three is access to goods, one is employee. Very good. Title one says that an employer must make reasonable accommodations to uh, allow their handicapped employees lowered workstation, grab bars in the bathroom, maybe TTY phone connections, where Title III deals with the access of the public to goods and services. This would be the curb ramp so a wheelchair can roll up on the sidewalk. This would be the elevator so that they don't have to navigate down a stairway. So those are the two ADA issues that you will need to understand. Title one, 